I want to start off with a, a Mark E. Smith quote from NME. Um, you said back in 1981, we're having a bit of a difficult time because people are coming along and sort of liking us, as opposed to the last few years where it's just been getting up people's backs. Got to change your tune. And last night on the middle break in Emmerdale Farm, there was a Vauxhall Corsa ad, mm -hmm. and Touch Sensitive was on it. Right. So the fall are liked universally. How do you feel about the fall being on a commercial ad? I don't think anything about it. I wasn't consulted about it. We are going to do Touch Sensitive tonight. You are? Oh, yeah. Right, right. You weren't consulted about it? No, no, these things are different, you know. So. Very funny, because I've been railing against car advertisements for about six months and they turn to TV on. It's like, well, I'm not saying all you that. <laughs> so you weren't too pleased? Well, I, I suppose I am, yeah. It's amazing how many people have wrote the song all of a sudden. Claiming to have? Well, yeah, it was, it was just me and uh, the keyboard player wrote it. And now there's 30 people on the uh, all of a sudden. And like, the, the, like the press guy. <laughs> he was in the studio. <laughs> it's quite interesting. And Totally Wired was featured on the BBC Commonwealth Games. I don't know, I don't. I, I only I heard this is all on the internet. There's some fanatics out there. I don't know, was it? But I heard that, I don't yeah. know. But the, the point being that back in the early 70s, the late 70s, um, you were very much for going down your own road and mass acceptance was not what the fall <coughs> was about back in those yeah, days. Yeah, well, what, what, what's happened is that all the people who were into that shit in them days have um, become uh, people of power. You know. and you, as you can tell, right, by any program you watch, they, they just play Smith songs, don't they? And, what they liked when they were 19. It's like some fellows can't grow up, I think. Right. But Touch Sensitive is a good song, so I don't mind that. Right. And uh, if we can go right back to Mark E. Smith in the 60s and the 70s. Um, 60s and 70s, isn't it? Uh, five. Your, your, formative, your formative years. Yeah, what you heard on the tra transistor radio and Radio Luxembourg and stuff like that. What? Uh, Falls music, falls music being described as buoyant rockabilly, ramshackabilly, mankabilly, rockabilly's in all of it. Where did you sort of hone in on, what artists did you get to hone in on rockabilly? Just, um, I, I didn't uh, listen to music until I was about 14, 15. We never had a record player in my house. Right. So that would have been in the early 70s? Yeah. So uh, we didn't... Only music in my house, in our, my parents' house, was uh, military stuff. My dad was a sergeant. So, so I, was, but I wasn't really interested in it, you know what I mean? Like, I did grow up... I was like 10 when the Beatles... Or like 5 or 6 when the Beatles and Stones were going on. And I wasn't... I was looked at it as something that was a bit effeminate, sort of. So I really didn't, like, listen to music till I was 14, 15. Right? And, can and you then I didn't like it, you know, you what did? I heard. <laughs> so you have to start doing something about it, really. Right. Can you remember the first single you bought? Yeah, Paranoid by Black Sabbath. <laughs> Says a lot, of it? Yeah. And when did you start getting this idea of a, a rockabilly punk band? Well, when I discovered music, I went through it very fast. So by the time I was like 17, I'd, 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 everything I'd heard, I didn't like at all. So, so you started sort of searching around for things. And so you just old stuff like Country and Western and Gene Vincent and stuff like that. Right. Stuff done before I was born, really. And you did it like almost like a history student, a music history student. You went through it all. Well, in a sort of way, yeah. Crash course, yeah. Yeah. And Captain Beefheart, he was also somebody that you Very much, took yeah. to. Yeah, yeah. He's been described as a, a Dada lyricist. 
you know, that he sort of came up with songs that were just the sound of the words, not what the words actually meant. Right. I was wondering, is something like Roush Rubble, is that a Cheatham Hill, is th are those sort of similar approaches where it's just actually the sound of the words? Not really, no, just, it's just that it took me a long time to develop my own voice. So. Right. I think that's a good thing about the, 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 the fall, really, is uh, there's no great influence there. One thing that irritates me about music is like you can really tell what they pinch. I mean, you, everybody steals things, but uh, in music, I mean, but, um, I find it very boring. It's like I've heard this before, you know. I mean? So Oasis and the Beatles. Was yeah, it's like yeah, around, you know, it's like the, the first four notes. I'm actually tone deaf as well, which is funny. Got a layman's ear, you know. I mean? But beef out. The only way I got into him was like it was it was the. It used to be on sale. It was that, you know, it was that pat. People forget this. People rewrite history, you know. Ca you know Captain, they used to give Captain Beefheart LPs away as booby prizes on the shows, you know. It was like uh, 90 pence, strictly personal, in Woolworths, you know. It was the only place they'd release it, you know. That's how I got into it. Right. Safe as Milk, is that a favourite of yours? Is that right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when it came to the actual showmanship, you know, and on stage and what you were going to do on stage, did you have any people who influenced you there? No. Did you bump into John Cooper Clark on the Manchester scene? In the, in very much, yeah. John was a bit of a great help to us at the start, actually. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, Clark was good. Casting your mind back, you see, you got to remember, uh, nobody liked us in Manchester at all. Right? And still the same, right? <laughs> but it's almost something that you you're not bothered about. It's almost like a part of your music that you should have this. Uh, no, well, it was like punk, then it was new wave and all that. We were just separate from it. We just went our own way, really. So it wasn't as though you heard the Sex Pistols and you said, "I want to do that," you know. Or well, yeah, but, but, but I'd, I'd had the group going for quite a while. When, yeah. when did the fall actually form? 76? Uh, in, in, in like a, you know, like a flat, you know, there's just three of us um, reading poetry out and just messing about, really. I didn't really like much except like garage music from the 60s and um, nothing really, so you had to do your own thing. Garage music like what the electric blue prunes, and yeah, stuff like. shit like that. Yeah. yeah, and it was reading poetry as well, so it was yeah, as much yeah, as well to start off like that. I was actually the guitar player at the start, and then when you actually formed, formed the band, and can you remember where you did your first gig? Yeah, it's like a Northwest Arts Cafe or something, right? Musicians Collective. And apparently the two other names that you were going out for was uh, The Outsiders or Flyman and The Fall. That's right, yeah. I'm you get done research, haven't you? Uh, Where's all this on? Is this on the internet? Uh, some articles as well. Actually. Jesus. And uh, The Outsiders is a bit more obvious. Hmm. Um, yeah. But it's been done about ten times, hasn't it? <laughs> right. And Flyman and the Fall, there's a right. very theatrical idea that you're going to have there. Yeah. What was that? You were going to go out as a fly. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And I'd end every sentence with bzzz. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you can't. Pity, you didn't, <laughs> so pity you didn't go out as Flyman I, and the Fall. I, you got his way ahead of its time, wasn't it, really? <laughs> And, uh, and every lyric had to end, you know, every song that's going zzzz. Right, right. The guitar went zzzz. So punk wasn't, you were called, a, you know, you were put in that bag, weren't now, you, punk? Now, yeah, now. Yeah, we Looking back. No, now we are. I don't think At the time you didn't see yourself as? I saw it as a bit of, as, I, I thought it was just a fashion thing. Don't think that now, but at the time. Where the people we, we were hanging around with, you know, 
we regarded anybody who signed up to a record company as a sellout, you know. Right. Never mind car adverts, you know, <laughs> anybody who um, dick us really. And you didn't see that Johnny Rotten at the time, you know, with the Silver Jubilee year and all that was going on around there, that, that they were making a valid point? No. No? Mm -hmm. They weren't being working class heroes? No. Who were your working class heroes? No, no. There's nobody around that you looked up to or anything like that, no? No, apart from like old rock and roll and old garage groups and a few German groups, can not. Mm -hmm. Stooges were good, I guess. What was it that you liked about Iggy Pop? Was it his total... The music was just like yeah. straight down the line. It wasn't heavy metal, it wasn't like... So you, you gotta, uh, I don't like these retro things, not like this, I mean, these retro programs, they sort of rewrite history completely, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I used to play concerts, they used to get spat at because they had long hair, you know, in London, you know. So you get drift, that's what the punk thing was all about, just... If you played a, a song that was slow, you'd get bottled off, you know what I mean? So I was not under no illusions, you know. So we used to do working men's clubs and that, you know, where the demand was for Led Zeppelin covers and all that. It's good training. And you did some of those too, did you, Led Zeppelin covers? And no, 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 oh. so, no, no, you, you, always did, stuck you to didn't you. get paid if you didn't do them. <laughs> and started off very young, you see. Yeah. And that was all, all about right. 18, you know. Mm -hmm. And that was all around the Manchester Manchester area. No, no, actually, that, that's what I should say because it wasn't. We were doing it. We weren't liked here at all. We still aren't. You know. The big one for us was uh, Liverpool and London. London and Liverpool were the only ones that put you on. Uh, put us on. Uh, but you hated being down in London, I understand. No, that's all. No? No. Never. Oh, so I read somewhere... I do now, but... You enjoyed that scene at the well, time? A lot of, a lot of, in them days, a lot of people used to just put things on you that weren't the truth. Which they always do. I wasn't going to complain about it, because it's free press and all that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember Tony Parsons at the NME who said we were like a socialist worker band and uh, Julie Birchall used to say we were a communist band, you know. We actually went down and met and I said, well, well neither of them two, you know. You're a pair of bloody liberal fucking coke snorting idiots, you know. And then suddenly, <laughs> the fall was shit for two years, you know what I mean? Until they went and got jobs at the Guardian, you know. <laughs> Whatever it was they went to. Yeah. So you didn't like the the left wing tag? No, because I thought they used they used people like us a lot. They tried to. Mm. That never changes. Mm. Yeah, I think stiff little fingers. They were trying to encourage them to get more and more political. That's right. It's a dangerous thing to do. <laughs> Belfast. Mm. That leads us nicely onto one of those weird things of where nature starts imitating art because when you released uh, Powder Keg it came out something like uh, six days before the Manchester bombing. Strange, huh? Did you sense what, what was the sort of inspiration for Powder Keg? I don't know. Did you sense trouble around Manchester? Well, if you're the true story, it, it was my sister was working in a shop there, you know, the centre. And she was very nervous about going to work, and I said to her, I said, well, stay at home, you know. It's one of them things, I can't explain it. She got on the bus to work, and she heard the explosion. She, was, she went an hour later, because I said, don't, you know, I don't think you should go today, somewhere. You know. She was halfway to town and the bomb went off. She'd have been there, probably, you know. Mm -hmm. But I know he was killed. 
And you had a similar kind of, uh, if you like, psychic thing with uh, Terry Way. Is that not right? <laughs> How did Terry Way come to be a subject that you wanted to write about? Well, he's, he's just going around being, you know, holy roller, and uh, that's what the song was about. You know, you, you know, you can't do that. You know, innocents should wear bells, you know, sort of thing. I felt terrible actually because when it came out, he was kidnapped like the next day or something, like, like the same week. He came out. Strange. Isn't it? Very strange. Yeah. Going back to the. And his brother rang me up as well. And and. His brother had been in contact with the intelligence services, you know, thinking like I knew something about it. Like, so one of them scenarios, you know. So I was like, Terry, who, you know, what you're about? said, oh, the guitar player wrote that. <laughs> Weird. The press must have been on your doorstep when that when the Manchester bombing happened. I would imagine. No. No. Could you sense that there was something in the air in Manchester in the months leading up to it? Powder Keg deals specifically with, with the Irish problem in a way, doesn't it? Mm. Could you sense there was something going on? Yeah, I could. You know. But there isn't an Irish problem, and a lot of the, there isn't an Irish problem in Manchester, there never has been. That, and that's why they didn't know anything about it. It's, you know, most terrorists, like all terrorists, are educated at the Sorbonne and uh, Paris and uh, like um, Cambridge and Oxford, aren't they? Mm. No matter what nationality they are, you know, that's the disgusting thing about it. The only people who suffered on that Manchester thing were like uh, shop girls like my sister. But half of them are about Irish anyway, you know what I mean? So what's the fucking point? You know, it's just stupid, isn't it? Mm. You don't bomb a university because they might get some of their own mates. Going way back again, starting uh, in the 70s, the Bingo Masters Breakout EP. Mm hmm. Now then, Step Forward Records. Going back a lot, don't tell me. Yeah, just, just to get the story for those that don't know, how did you, having said that a record See deals. You write books, you know. Well, how do. <laughs> <laughs> Remember those Halicon days, 1977, you're working there. I wasn't necessarily saying they were happy. Well, well, yeah, right. Halcyon or whatever. So what were you doing in 1977? I was working for the Radio Times. Oh, that's good. Mm. <laughs> Do what? Market research. That was interesting, wasn't it? Kind of, kind of, yeah. What market research? And what, what, who listens to what? Or what? Uh, just about who reads the, th the thing and what articles are like, that kind of stuff. Mm. It's sort of a, a fair magazine once, wasn't it? It's a massive magazine, yeah. It's great, isn't it? Yeah. Eight million at one point. Jesus, yeah. Yeah. yeah Forget that, you know? yeah. Give up, they sort of give up the BBC all the time, don't they? You don't think that? Give up? Well, they sort of give up all the time, don't they? What, don't try, or...? I don't know what it is with them. Like you watch the BBC, there's more advertisements on the BBC now, trailers for their programmes, than there is on the bloody Channel 4. Mm. Mm. There's more trailers for like programmes that are on BBC Gold, whatever it is, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And it, you, get, you get quite annoyed, I think. You know, you paid a hundred quid to be told that, you know, you can't watch England play and you can't. <laughs> and if you want to watch anything good, you've got to pay it more money out, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's like this little self-destruct mechanism. Like getting Mark and Lard on, you know, in the afternoon, that's like short, short, big turn off, isn't it? <laughs> Talking about record deals and right, right at the beginning, mm -hmm. in the 70s, you said initially you weren't even thinking in terms of a record deal. Mm -hmm. How did the step forward thing come about then? Through uh, Danny Baker, from enough. 
Can you tell us a bit more about how it happened? Well, Danny Baker was the work of uh, Zigzag, I think. It's it like a rock. Moment. And nobody had signed us up in the north. Or anything. And, um, <coughs> and uh, Baker's Dan Danny saw us and, um, in Huddersfield. Was supporting Sham 69 or something like that. And when we recorded that Bingo Masters, it was like uh, it was like a year, it was like two years before it came out because nobody had released it. You know. Did shop it around, like. But uh, Baker just went into Copeland and said, um, "What was that?" You know, he just said, "You got to release this." And Copeland was going, "Well, I'm too busy with the, this new group, the Police." You know, like, "All right, you fucking you know, like, just." You know. Because uh, Baker was like, you know, he thought of the voice of the street, you know, that's how he got away with it. Really. Right. And then how did. So Cobble was like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's quite weird, really. What do you think to Miles Cobble? I don't know, really. As your first impression of the music business? He was always, he was always okay with uh, me. And then, rough I mean, he took us to America in 1979 or something like that. Ridiculous. I mean, it was crazy, isn't it? Your first trip to America, I understand, that sort of uh, gave you quite a bit of inspiration of one sort or another about class systems. That the class system in America was very different from the class system here, mm. what what kind of conclude? What what did America strike you as at the time? It's funny this because I was uh, watching that Boogie Nights thing, you know, like, palm thing. Yeah. The other night, I was saying to someone, that's what actually America was like in the late seventies. It was just sex, and, and now it's complete opposite. That you know, people are frightened to kiss each other and all that. Imagine us lot. I mean, I remember the drummer, he wouldn't even go out of the house. <laughs> Once he got to LA, he was that frightened. <laughs> of the violence? No, no, it just like, it was just, it was always like that, you know, the worse, you know. We'd be playing clubs, it's just like people shagging in front of you, you know, it's like we, see I've got three Catholic lads, you know, from council estates, 16, 17, and, Playing in the group, you know. Like <laughs> and Miles Copeland is going like, you know, like here they are, you know, the big new sensation and all that. It's like fucking weird. In fact, we were on. Then we, he signed us to A and M Records, and A and M dumped us in, in LA where we got there. Just dumped us. So they're asleep on the beach for like for two weeks. That was that America in them days. It's completely different, man. That's straight. Yeah. And the class system there, there wasn't one, it was money, was it? I don't know what you're saying, what you mean? That, you know, you were upper class if you had tons of money, not if you had the right accent or something like that. I don't know, I never thought about it. So when you return to England... I'm not, I'm not anti-American, mate, but they are, they are, they are very snobby. You do find that out. But they go in periods, you know. <coughs> they Did change every, you know, like, you know, you go back one year, like, next year, you know, like we went back in the mid-80s and you couldn't eat cheese. Cheese was the, the, the fucking new terrorism, you know. You go back 85 and milk is dangerous, you know, and olive oil, you know. You go back in 89 and it's like, Olive oil is good for you, you know. Give it a drift. There's no, um, you know, like they're not like you. You know, 1999 is a long time ago to them. So they're new fads, and the past is gone and forgotten. Yeah. I don't know. I, I'm not. I'm not anti-American. Mm -hmm. 
Because our fans are really know what we're talking about, you know. It's, um, and they must, you've got to be very brave to be out of. The irony is, you've got to be very brave to go against the grain in America, I think. Especially now. Whereas when we first went, it was the hip thing to be against the, against everything, everybody, mm. doctors, every, you know, everybody you met, which is a shock to me. <laughs> and uh, now it's the complete opposite, and it'll probably be different in five years. Mm -hmm. And so, how did the rough trade deal come about? First time round. No idea, to be honest. Um, And uh, we were poached uh, by Jeff Travis. On the strength of the EP? Or? I don't know. Mm. I didn't have much to do with it at that time. I was, a bit, I was already sort of giving up on it. You, know. you said that the band nearly split in 82. Oh, uh -huh. you split every week. <laughs> And it didn't, thanks to the success of that one album. What album? The, uh, what's one of the, just mentioned earlier. Ex induction hour. Right, no, so we left, we, yeah, we walked out of Rough Shack. And looking for a deal. Yeah, we got, we got on camera. Right. With a, it's a mad fella. Run. And then there was a big change for you personally, and also for the band in '83 when Bricks joined the band. Correct. Yeah. Who became your wife? Mm -hmm. Now, how did the ba how did the band sort of focus change? Not much really. It's just rhythm guitar. You know, she's playing. Mm -hmm. I suppose it got a lot of, um, there's a lot of pressure for tonight's show, you know, to get a girl keyboard player on now, the DVD. Is that but I, 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 uh, Bricks was a very good musician, though. <laughs> Bricks was a very good musician. Right. How did you meet her? Met her in Chicago. We got married, we were married for five years. Okay. And how long have you known her when she was in the band, when she joined the band? How long? Yeah. Two years. Yeah. Right. right. We were short of her. We needed a, a rhythm guitarist, you know. We needed somebody who can pl In them days, you couldn't get guitarists. You had the heavy metal or indie. Same now. Mm -hmm. Get anybody, regardless of her image, Bricks could actually. She was brought up playing country rhythm. Oh, right. Which is what I wanted. Right. You can spend like. You can spend weeks with a British guitarist trying to teach him to play just basic rhythm guitar, you know. It's, it's a fucking hopeless situation. You've been called, you've been said that you're. When it comes to choosing musicians, you've got a very didactic approach. Like what? Like you're very, very particular, and if it just wasn't working in Australia, then you'd send a musician home and stuff like that. You, mm. you, you, you weren't sentimental at all. No. It's got to be the sound. Mm -hmm. um, and at one point in the 80s, when uh, Marsha Schofield joined, Ah. That was at one point where the sound started getting bigger, didn't it, for a while? Yeah, for sure, yeah. Why was that? Well, Marshall was good, isn't it? Mm. What, what do you mean? Well, Why a big Marshall fan of him? Uh, no, just that you, you, you'd be saying a lot of the time that you're keen on stripping the sound down. Right, right, so right. So right. should be minimalist and, and, and that. And at one point, you were, the four was actually you know, with those singles, Ghost in My House and uh, Victoria, you were going down a kind of mainstream chart road. 
Correct. So. How, how did that come about? Who was who was in charge of that vision? Well, me and uh, me. Mm -hmm. Did you want chart success? No, it wasn't a goal. No. What What was the goal? The goal was to have a, like a, a, a you know a good looking group that played alternative intelligent music. That's all I do. So the chart element of that was not. Um. I heard I, you, you said somewhere that singles are some almost like disposable fast food. You know, they're just around for a few weeks. You, that's how you regard singles. That sometimes as a kind of crap. That, that's what. I, that, that's what. I, and I still look at it like that. It's like it's like a workout for the group. I always think. Right. For some better. So, you know, Ghost and Victoria were shocks to me, the, the chart and all that shit. And stacked against... So yeah, I've, I've, only, I'm, I've only really started watching television again, me, in the last year. You know. I'm, I'm that sort of person, and I don't read music press. I, I just read books, man. It sounds uh, precious, but that's the way, you know. Is history still... So it's only in uh, retrospect that you know, people like you tell me these things. I don't even know them more on the internet. Apparently there's a history of your fucking life. You know? mm -hmm. and I, I think it's very important not to... That's your job. You know, so that's, my job is not... You know, I don't... I can't afford to listen to... It's not like we're like mega rock stars. You know, my sort of thing is just to keep working. Right. And developing, you know, and otherwise it's pointless because it's. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So you never. Well, look they, back. The, the, the smart idea is to sort of get a load of money and retire and all that shit, which is what everybody does. But that's not my. It's not why I started it, and it's the way I am. There's a lot of bullshit that, but I mean, that's. I mean, I didn't even know that. I didn't even know till the members of the new group, who were like 23, told me that Victoria was in the top 40. Can you believe this? I didn't even know what. Because there was, I am still like that. I don't. If you if you look at what people say about you and what people think about you and what's going on, I, I think your um, function is pointless. Which gets us back to what I was saying before, you know. Like every record you hear, I've heard it before. You know. Every three years you get somebody trying to be the Rolling Stones, every three years you get somebody trying to be the Beatles, and, and they feel the, the sort of generation that haven't heard it before. Or, which is worse now, they listen to the same music the mothers and fathers listen to, which I find really frightening. So kids dancing to Tamla Motown, you think is bad news. No, they're not going to listen to Tom all the time. They, 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 what they listen to now is because, you know, uh, people have got wealthy and all that. So when, when, when a group like Coldplay or something come along and sat, just sound like Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd, all the kids love it, but what they don't realise is because the mums and dads played it when they were like five in the cradle. You know? Whereas I was from a different attitude. Anything my father or mother liked, he just, he just didn't. Do you not see that? I wonder if the kids know that Coldplay is actually... Of course they won't. I was saying they don't. They don't. Yeah. Uh, they don't. Okay. Well, you can't blame them. They don't know. Yeah, yeah. Because they're not like buffs like me and you. You know what I mean? And so returning to what you said, your function, your function is never to look back. Hmm. Never to listen to what people say about what you're doing, but just hmm. to sort of like operate in a artist's artist vacuum. Yeah. Yeah. Vacuum. The emphasis on vacuum. <laughs> Not artist. <laughs> the early 90s, there's a change in direction. Well, it, it appeared so in terms of the single telephone thing. Mm -hmm. How did that dance hip hop collaboration come about? <coughs> Well, I thought the only good music around that time was, was the, the garage house 
you know, the, before ecstasy was hip and all that, and it was quite, I thought it was good, it was really fast and that. Cold Cut were involved in that, and that's how I got involved with them. Right, right. But um, by the time I worked with them, they'd already had uh, Lisa Stansfield and all that, so... I think it was all right for a one-off, you know. 1990 was, was when the sort of Happy Monday Stone Roses thing was, like, peaking. Hmm. How did it feel to have Manchester, Manchester, and all that scene right there in your your city? Mm. I'm from Salford, man. Right? That's quite distinct, isn't it? It's a city, yeah. Right. Mm. <laughs> what? How did it feel? I was very embarrassed because I was living in Chicago at the time, and uh, then, I, uh, then I emigrated to uh, Edinburgh for two years to get away from it. You hate it as much as that? Uh, yeah, I don't, you know, I'm just, I never liked the Manchester scene anyway. It's, Man the Manchester scene to me is Herman's Hermits and fucking the Hollies and... Freddie and the Dreamers? Yeah, afraid so. And Stone Roses and that, and I don't, they're nice lads and that, I know them. You know. It's just fucking show bands, you know. Nothing to do with me. And how about Joy Division and... But nothing to do with me. And the Smiths? Nothing to do with me. Someone described the Smiths as occupying the territory between Freddie and the Dreamers and Joy Division. Can you see that? Is it all no. rehash? Is it all rehash? I, I don't know. Yeah, probably, right? Yeah. Mm. Did you see the film, 24 Hours? Yeah, it was in it. All right. What do you think of the film? I walked out after I was on. <laughs> after, after, after. Depressing. I didn't, I didn't see it. Extremely depressing. Yeah, I was all in it for a minute. And what were you doing? I said hello. I had five lines. <laughs> no, I, did, I had like a lot of parts in it. Right. So Ed. I said to Ed, we can't do this, we can't do that, you know, we can't do that, we can't do that. So I reduced it to like, just me going up to Tony Wilson and saying, here we go, here we go. Which is what, you know, like Marlon Brando in that, that Vietnam film. But the film itself you found too, de too depressing, yeah? No, I had about six scenes and uh, between me and Ed, we, I got paid for, you know, for all these scenes that I didn't do. They had scenes like written in the script, right? Me fucking uh, bloody Tony Wilson's wife in a bog. I said, nope. And then he's what, what, he's one of me playing out the ass end and I kick somebody in the face. Uh, I said, nope. <laughs> so get crossing it out. So they wanted nope. you to do the sex and violence thing? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, uh, so at the end of it, it just ended up with one thing. <laughs> I go like, it's the Steve Cougar's walking, and they go, well, it's, it's Tony. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Just a couple of sort of mid '90s memories mm -hmm. after you've been in Edinburgh because you hated the Manchester scene. Yeah, I didn't. Um, uh, there was reasons I went to Edinburgh, personal. But, uh, right, right. It did change, you know. But then in '94, there was interesting uh, <coughs> collaboration within Spiral Carpets. Oh yeah. Which was I want you, and you're right. on top of the pops wearing a dinner jacket. A leather jacket. A leather jacket. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, it's, I think in the video. I don't know. And uh, how did that collaboration come about? I don't know. They just asked me to sing on them. Oh right, no, right. They right. They, they were uh, they were going down the charts. I get this a lot. You see, they, they, when the the, the the sort of success starts going down, you see a lot of groups when they start not selling. And then, like the like teen or student audience moves away, they always say like we want to be like the fall. You know, we never wanted to be like pop stars. We just wanted to be like the fall. You know? And in Spiral Carpets was case yeah. Well, they were losing sales, weren't they? They had no songs, so I wrote three songs for them. Two of which they used, and one of which they took my vocals off. Uh -huh. 
And then Bricks rejoins in 95. How did that come about? A big, big mistake. No, I needed a guitarist, so she came back. She was good. And then the year after that, what was like probably the most critically acclaimed album during the 90s, The, the Light User Syndrome? Do you think so? Mm. Don't know, I've is, it, it. is it a stick out album for you? Is it one that means no, a lot? No? no. If we could sort of finish off with uh, one, one word or two words that come to mind, I'm going to mention a few people that you've been involved with and ah, uh, ah. just uh, top of your head things. So, spoke about Miles Copeland before. What word springs to mind with Miles Copeland? Why do you know him or something? You've got, you got no, something no, about him, haven't no, you? No, I haven't, no. You have something? <laughs> no, I always liked Miles. I liked his dad's best. He used to stay at his house, he used to put me up, which was very nice. And nobody the, in London had touched us. And he was the American ambassador, wasn't he? So Washington. His dad was the head of the CIA. That's right, that's right. Yeah. But his dad was great, because I'd be crashed out on his couch and he'd go, see that case over there? That's what Kim Philby left that case. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, what Kim, Kim, that's from Kim Philby's house, you know. And he always used to go on about his dad. He was he used to get him pissed at night when Miles had gone to bed. He started talking about the fourth man and all that, and I said, just talking rubbish. But it was right, it was blunt. His dad was great. But Miles was all right as well. He had trust in us, you know. Right. Nobody else did. A lot of crap talked about Britain, you know, about giving new talent shit, you know. That's what was the problem is, you know, it's like, uh, there's no encouragement of talent, you know, it's, 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 you don't mean. For anything new? Mm. Of course, yeah. mm. Richard Branson? Yeah. What springs to mind when you think of Richard Branson? He harassed me for uh, quite a few months. But I was right then on. Uh, uh, Tony Wilson? He's that right, Tony. Link Ray. What word springs to mind when you think of Link Ray? God. John Lydon. I don't know Speculator. Prophecy speculator. Billy Bragg. That's the next one you know, isn't it? <laughs> Head of the Radio Times. <laughs> Michael Clark. When's Billy, Billy Bragg going to become Prime Minister? Isn't he? Michael Clark. Yeah, he's alright. He's alright. I don't keep in touch with people. And finally, Morrissey. Be close to me. You're a fan, aren't you? No. What are you asking me for then? Just interested. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mark E. Smith. All right. Have a great gig tonight. Nice talking yeah. to you. I must get off now. Sound check. Okay.